Hey there fellow primates, I hope this video finds you well on this Friday late afternoon. Uh, I hope you had a good week. I had a good week. Um, did something cool on Wednesday. I hosted two seminars for the European Venom Network. It was a, a talk by Joachim uh, Surm about the evolution of venom in cnidarians and a really cool talk by Stano Pekar about what happens to spider venom when spiders specialize in certain types of prey. Now, if you were so unlucky as to have missed this uh, seminar, uh, you're lucky now because they were recorded and they are online on the YouTube channel of the European Venom Network. So I will put the link uh, underneath the video. You can go and check them out. Now, what shall we talk about this week? Let's start with an experience that is quite widely shared uh, amongst scientists. You would walk up at a party, say, to a person you haven't met and they ask, oh, what do you do? And you say, well, I'm a biologist, I'm a scientist. They say, oh, that's so interesting. I say, yeah, what do you work on? And they start telling and then their smiles fade and their eyes glaze over and then they may leave and not talk to you again. Because there seems to be a discrepancy between how interesting and important scientists think their work is and the perception of people who are not themselves scientists or even people not in your field. Give an example. This paper was just published in a journal called The Science of Nature. And the, the title of the paper is Temporal Stability of Fecal Cortisol Metabolites in Mountain Dwelling Ungulates. Hmm, that is pretty niche, especially specialized. How interesting is this? You know, the feces of hoofed mammals that live in mountains and the metabolites you can find in their feces. Hmm, that's the kind of topic that perhaps not even your loving mom would be interested in. But you'd be wrong because that's what science does. It tackles broad and deep questions by looking at tiny specialized bits, uh, tiny windows into the larger uh, reality. So in this case, the authors were interested uh, to see whether animals such as red deer and chamois are disturbed by, for instance, human interference uh, or you know encroachment upon their territory. And the way to do that, if you don't want to actually observe the interactions, is to look for metabolites of stress hormones like cortisol in their feces. Now, you don't want to be running around in the mountains with a bucket to catch the poop that comes out of the red deer. That's uh, logistically a bit too challenging. It would be better if you could pick up a feces uh, when you find them, uh, even if they have been deposited a couple of days before, if those metabolites are still there. And this is indeed what the authors show, uh, independent of environmental variables such as rain and variations in temperature, a couple of days after the feces were excreted, they still contain detectable traces of these stress hormone metabolites. And that provides useful information, for instance, for deciding uh, about conservation measures. Uh, so. Very seemingly specialized niche topic actually affords uh, access to a larger and interesting topic, namely the preservation of red deer and chamois in their natural habitats. And that's what science is, of course, fantastic at. It makes the fundamental mysteries of nature tractable by studying seemingly quotidian. And there's no better illustration of this general strategy than the establishment of what biologists call model organisms. These are organisms that have dedicated research communities that study every aspect of them. And in that sense, through this tiny window of the model organism, try to gain general insights, uh, broad principles of biology. For instance, the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster, or in this case, the nematode roundworm Cena rhabditis elegans, uh, or C. elegans in short. And this worm has been established as a model organism for about five decades. And this was due to this guy, Sidney Brenner. Uh, it is this week, at six, exactly three years ago, that he died on the 5th of April uh, 2019 at the ripe old age of 92. And he had an extraordinarily creative and accomplished career. For instance, he is the guy who came up with the idea of messenger RNA and then helped do the work to show that messenger RNA actually exists. Uh, he did seminal work uh, that led to the discovery that the genetic code is a triplet code with three bases, code for one amino acid. But that's not what he got the Nobel Prize for. He got the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 2002 together with uh, Robert Horvich and John Salston for their work 
on C. elegans, the nematode, and I quote, for their discoveries concerning genetic regulation of organ development and programmed cell death. Because in the late 1960s, early 1970s, Sidney Brenner wanted to find an organism uh, that made it tractable to study the relationship between the cellular basis of body plants and the genetic underpinnings of it, something small, something culturable in the lab. And so C. elegans is a perfect organism to do these things in with an invariant cell number where you can trace the cell lineages of all body components. So it was, a co it was due to Sidney Brenner in the end that we can do this journal club because the paper I want to discuss today is about a satellite model organism of C. elegans, the uh, nematode Prisioncus pacificus. And this is an image from the website of Ralph Sommer, who has been instrumental in uh, establishing Pristioncus pacificus as a satellite model organism. And the paper uh, is titled Comparative Reconstruction of the Predatory Feeding Structures of the Polyphenic Nematode Pristioncus pacificus. This is a paper that was published in the last issue of the journal Evolution and Development. And the theme here is the evolution of novelty. Where do novel things come from in evolution? And in order to address this, let's start with something written in 18, sorry, yeah, 1859 in my trusty penguin edition of the first edition of Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species. What did Darwin write about the origin of novelty? Well, he wrote this. He says, as natural selection acts solely by accumulating slight, successive, favorable variations, it can produce no great or sudden modification. It can act only by very short and slow steps. Hence, the canon of natura non facit saltum, which means nature doesn't make leaps, which every fresh addition to our knowledge tends to make more strictly correct, is on this theory simply intelligible. We can plainly see why nature is prodigal in variety, though niggard in innovation. And niggard means scarce, uh, scarce or scanty in innovation. So he articulates here the ontology of the evolutionary worldview that novelty can only arise by rehashing, modifying what was already present. You can only build with the building blocks you have, you only have what you inherited from your ancestors. And this was a fundamental truth of evolution and still is. And this was also something that became almost an epistemological premise for those whose work was there to trace the origin of, uh, of novelty in evolution. For instance, this is E. Ray Lancaster. He was the third director of the museum I worked for, uh, and he was a disciple of the great T. H. Huxley, and he was an evolutionary morphologist interested in tracing the origin of novelties, novel structures. And he wrote a very uh, famous paper published in 1881 with the short title Limulus an Arachnid. Now, Limulus is, of course, the horseshoe crab, and at that time, uh, horseshoe crabs were thought to have certain things in common with crustaceans, perhaps to be crustaceans. For instance, they were aquatic. And he decided, no, if you look carefully at its structure, it's clearly a chelicerate, as we call them now, uh, something related to terrestrial arachnids like scorpions and spiders. It's not a crustacean. So, but he also wrote something to do with what I said, this almost epistemological premise that was based on the realization that novelty is only relative. And you wrote this in this monograph. In deriving the hexapods and myriapods, which are the insects and the centipedes and millipedes and relatives, from Galeodus, which was a, an arachnid, a sun spider, we should have to suppose the antennae of the former to arise de novo from nowhere, a supposition which is contrary to one of the fundamental principles of phylogeny, viz. that new organs do not arise de novo as new parts, but by the modification of pre existing parts. So it is almost a methodological and epistemological premise here that if you want to study the origin of novelty, you need to be able to trace it back to identifiable antecedent states. And that's not surprising, because if your job is evolutionary morphology, then you'd better be able to trace back novelties to precursors, because otherwise there's nothing to explain. Then the origin of novelty becomes one of special creation, for instance, and this is the context in which Darwin wrote the citation that I just read out. And this was a, a common and often explicit assumption in scientific debates about the origins of novelty in the late 19th century literature. Now, it, I discuss this in detail in my forthcoming book. I just give you one 
uh, extra voice to affirm this. And this was E.W. Lancaster's friend Anton Dorn. And Anton Dorn is famous for having uh, founded the Zoological Station, that is still an active research institution in Naples today. And in 1875, he published an infamous paper in which he tried to derive vertebrates from annelid ancestors. And in this monograph, he wrote, against such objections, and his hypothesis was that the penis of vertebrates had uh, evolved from the gills of, of worms, um, against such objections is to be directed the entire weight of the principles that in the first place are to be invoked against any mode of explanation, which without compelling need calls upon that those ex machina new formation, which is neither better nor worse than generatio equivoca, which is the origin of something from a precursor state that is fundamentally dissimilar. Sorry, I, uh, I was eating some snacks beforehand and they seem to still float around in my oral cavity. So, re-articulating in different words, what here really comes across is the methodological principle. Uh, the know the novel or uh, know the novel origins allowed, because that is a chink in the explanatory armory of evolutionary morphology. A little aside, they were friends, Lancaster and Dawn, and they even lived together for a while in Italy, in uh, Naples. And when Anton Dawn died in 1909, I, oh, I, th I thought I had that thing open. Let me just quickly find it. When he died in 1909, he read Lancaster, um, wrote an obituary for Nature, in which he celebrated the many achievements of his friends, of his friend, in, in particular, the founding of the zoological station in Naples. And in this uh, obituary, he recounts a few anecdotes of what it was like to be there in, in this case, 1872, and the challenges faced by Dorn in, in setting up this uh, zoological station. So he says, Lancaster writes, an example of the innumerable difficulties which Dorn had to surmount is the challenge to a duel brought to him by the representative of the Neapolitan architect whom he had agreed to employ for the design of the elevation. This gentleman considered himself insulted because Dawn refused to promise him a 10% commission instead of the 5%, which is usual in Northern Europe. I had to act as Dawn's second and conferred with the Neapolitan architect's friend. For my insisting that Dawn was a soldier of the German emperor and a very deadly man with the saber, and determined not to yield to any nonsense, the challenge was withdrawn, and the insulted architect completed his task very satisfactorily. On another occasion, in my presence, Dawn was deliberately threatened with an assassina with assassination by a Neapolitan who could not get his own way. You forget, the Neapolitan said, that the night is dark, and that for a few francs I can get a couple of men to deal with you. Another very awkward thing was that the young German architect who had come to Naples with Dawn and was living with us in the Palazzo Torlonia suddenly went quite mad and had to be sent home under escort. Happily, he completely recovered. So this is just a little flavor of uh, uh, the, the almost festive obituary, very uh, complimentary obituary Lancaster wrote for his, his friend Anton. Now, back to the evolution of novelty. It's still a fundamental problem and a fascinating topic in modern biology. Uh, and if you want to start reading about it, there's a good place to start. A 2014 book by Günther Wagner titled Homology, Genes and Evolutionary Innovation. And this focus is in great depth on this question. Where do biological novelties come from? And in a paper published in 2015 in Zoologischer Anzeiger, he has a sort of uh, capsule summary of some of the research agenda associated with this topic, and he distinguishes two types of novelties. The real true novelties, new body parts, he calls type 1 novelties, and he gives us examples, for instance, the wings of insects, the head of vertebrates. Uh, and these are novelties that seem to have no ancestral antecedents, no precursors, they seem to pop out of nowhere. And they're distinct from type 2 novelties that are seeming novelties, but that are really radical transformations of already pre-existing body parts. For instance, the limbs of tetrapods are modified fish fins. So that's novelty rooted in a radical transformation. So these two concepts are the conceptual framework for understanding what uh, Harry et al. did in a paper I want to discuss briefly now. So, that paper, The Comparative Reconstruction of the Predatory Feeding Structures of the Polyphenic Nematode Pristiongus Pacificus, was published in Evolution and Development, 
uh, in the latest issue. Clay's and Harry, first author, is an undergraduate student, so well done, Harry. Uh, Sonia Massar is a graduate student, and the senior author is Eric Rexdale. Now, what they wanted to understand is the origin of a specific novelty, namely movable cuticular teeth at the front end of Pristionchus nematode. So if you look in this slide, on the left hand you can see a narrow mouthed uh, form of this worm and the right image is a wide mouthed form. The narrow mouthed form has on the dorsal side in its mouth, in blue indicated here, a cuticular tooth, a dorsal tooth. All Pristionchus pacificus have that. But some Pristionchus have a wide mouthed form in which they also have a subventral asymmetrically located it's on the right side of the body teeth uh, tooth so they have two teeth uh, uh, but not all uh, of the uh, specimens of the species have it and it depends and what it depends on is indicated in the right it depends on the environment in which the larvae live if the larvae live in a situation where they are starving there's not enough food or where they are overcrowded then these environmental pressures can induce the development of the subventral right hand side tooth and with these two, two teeth together they can bite so the narrow mouth mouthed form with the one tooth the dorsal tooth they all eat just microbes the bacteria uh, in the culture plates in which they live but uh, the two teethed forms can also additionally eat larger prey they can eat fungi they can even attack bite kill and eat other nematodes so uh, and it's an environmentally induced change in behavior that's facilitated by this novelty. So where do these teeth come from? Because C. elegans doesn't have these teeth. And C. elegans has a very similar cellular anatomy as more distantly related nematodes, but the front end has not been reconstructed in Pristionca. So that's what the, uh, the author set out to do. And what they did is they didn't go to the microscope. They went to Ralph Sommers. Uh, the guy who established Pristionchus as a satellite model organism, because he had done uh, previously a very detailed transmission electron microscope study of the morphology of this worm. And so they got 2,662 serial transmission electron micrographs from Rolf, and they used these uh, to reconstruct in excruciating uh, detail the 74 cells, epithelial cells, myoepithelial cells and syncytia of the mouth, the pharynx and the face. Yes, these uh, nematode, nematode workers call this featureless anterior end of a tube-like creature the face uh, of Pristionchus. Uh, and they did it of one specimen because the cell lineage of these nematodes is invariant. So if you reconstruct the uh, cellular anatomy of one individual, in this case an adult hermaphrodite, you should be able to generalize that to all specimens of that species. And they found that they could homologize everything in Pristionchus with C. elegans because uh, they could find homologs of every anterior cell, every syncytium and every nucleus, the same number of them, the same relative positions. So just to give you two indications, um, in this image you can see the reconstruction of the epithelial or myoepithelial cells of the mouth and face with uh, longitudinal extensions. Uh, and in this particular image, you can see the pharyngeal cells uh, in the left panel and the, uh, fer the fer pharyngeal muscle cells. And in the middle and the right panel, you can see the nuclei of these pharyngeal muscle cells. All reconstructed in beautiful, exquisite detail. This is a 21 or so page paper. Uh, very detailed morphological description, which we won't go into. But then where does the novelty come from? Where do these teeth come from that C. elegans doesn't have, Pristiancus does have? Well, they come from differences, and there are a couple. Uh, and the most important ones are these. So here you can see PM1, this is the pharyngeal muscle cell 1, with its various extensions, and they insert on the teeth. You can see here at the top of the image on the left-hand side is their dorsal tooth. So they have uh, an insertion of a particular muscle that in C. elegans inserts just on the body cuticle. Another difference is uh, visible here. You can see here uh, H3 and H4. These are uh, epidermal cells. And H4 extends forward um, much further than in um, C. elegans, because in C. elegans, this is a cell that secretes trunk cuticle. 
but in Pristionchus it also has a medial extension and secretes a cuticle around the mouth area, not just the trunk. And a third difference is indicated in this picture where you can see on the left three epidermal cells, E cells, in C. elegans and on the right in Pristionchus. And in C. elegans these epidermal cells they form a nice smooth tube at the tip of the worm but not in Pristionchus, there they extend further forward. So what you can see here is a cross-section through them where they secrete cuticle anterior to, uh, to form the cuticle of additional mouth parts, as it were, that you don't find in C. elegans. So in summary, the novelty in Pristionchus, these teeth that C. elegans doesn't have, they don't come from new cells because they have the same cells as C. elegans. They have the same syncytia, the same number of them, and the same relative uh, positions. What differs is that in Pristionchus these cells may have different shapes and different spatial arrangements and, and, and different extensions. So what you get is that seeming type 1 novelty, the uh, origin of teeth that you don't see outside of the group to which uh, Pristionchus belongs. They come from the modification of pre-existing cells because they grow and extend in different ways and more cuticle is secreted. So they are rooted in radical transformations of pre-existing structures, type 2 novelties, namely uh, the arrangement of muscle cells in the pharynx and uh, epidermal cells, the enteromedial extension of the hip 4 uh, epidermal cells. They don't just line the anterior, uh, sorry, the, the, the trunk cuticle, the body wall cuticle as they do in uh, in C. elegans, they also line parts of the mouth apparatus, the anterior extension of these E epidermal cells to line new structures to secrete new structures, and finally expansions of the PM1 pharyngeal muscle cells into neighboring cells, something you also don't see in C. elegans. Now, if you then look at the photograph here, C. elegans on the left, Pristionchus on the right, uh, this color blue is a structure in C. elegans called the metastechostome, where there is no teeth. But there is the insertion of the PM1 pharyngeal muscle cells, and it is these pharyngeal muscle cells that insert on the novelty in Pristionchus, the teeth. So the authors conclude that the teeth, the subventral teeth, as well as the dorsal teeth, are metastechostomal structures. So there you have it. An apparent something out of nothing, a new novelty, a structure that wasn't present before, these teeth coming actually from subtle modifications of the shape and arrangement of pre-existing cells. Something evolves out of seemingly nothing. So this is a very simple example where beautiful morphological work, really in the spirit of the evolutionary morphologists of the late 19th century, I think if they've been alive and be able to read this paper, they would be unbelievably excited about the sophistication of the techniques these authors can bring to bear on such problems and trace novelties to their ancestral roots. Now, there's something else going on because, as I mentioned, these teeth allow a behavior that the worms couldn't have without the teeth. There is a functional innovation. That's the word. The word innovation is used for functional novelties. There's a functional innovation associated with these structural novelties. And incidentally, in a paper just published in Current Biology by Kathleen Quach and Srikant Chalasani, which I don't have time to discuss in detail, but it's titled Flexible Reprogramming of Pristiongus Pacificus Motivation for Attacking Cenorhabditis Elegans in Predator-Prey Competition. Gorgeous, sophisticated paper that shows that because Pristiongus can be induced to have teeth, uh, based upon uh, the relative availability of bacterial prey, they can change their behavior accordingly because teeth can be used to bite. They can bite, as you can see in this image on the left, uh, larval C. elegans, injure them fatally and eat them. They can use them as additional food when there's not enough bacterial food. They can also attack uh, adult C. elegans, but they don't use them as food. They can kill them, but it takes a while. It could be 20 or more bites over six hours or so uh, before Pristiongus can kill uh, an adult uh, C. elegans and then use it as food. That seems like quite, quite hard work. But they can bite them not just for predatory purposes, they can bite them to deter them from their territory. So the C. elegans leave the bacteria 
that Pristiuncus wants to eat alone, so they use biting with his teeth for predatory purposes and territorial purposes based upon decisions they make informed by the abundance or lack thereof of bacteria. So what you see here is the emergence of uh, purposeful functional behavior in a nervous system that is composed of only 300 neurons, exactly 302 in C. elegans, that is work done by C. Sidney Brenner and colleagues published in uh, 1986, an immense atlas of the nervous system uh, of C. elegans, uh, about 300 cells in Pristiuncus as well, where you can see that this new structural feature, these teeth, can expand the behavioral repertoire of this worm and um, uh, you know, they can integrate environmental information to make different decisions about what is optimal for maintaining their fitness. Do I bite to deter uh, competitors or do I bite smaller worms to eat them myself? So again, something seems to arise out of almost nothing. Um, and that is the beauty of this approach in science where you go for very specific and specialized windows into reality to try to find broader general truths. You, you keep peeling away the layers of a small problem until you create some insight into the vague shape of complex reality. Now, I will stop talking, it's been 26 minutes, but if you're interested in this emergence of purposeful behavior out of seemingly almost nowhere, certainly mindless nowhere, uh, this book by uh, Daniel Dennett, from bacteria to back and back, uh, from bacteria to Bach and back, the evolution of minds. It's a really cool book where he looks at this in detail how purpose arises in evolution in a system and from a big starting point where purpose doesn't exist. Now, I hope you find that interesting. I don't really read literature on nematodes often, but uh, I thought it was a beautiful illustration of a fundamental topic in biology, the origin of novelty. Next week, we are not going to celebrate the death day of uh, a biologist. We're going to celebrate the birthday of a biologist, the 250th birthday of this dude, Etienne Jaffroy St. Hilaire. Uh, and we're going to look at a modern myth that has arisen around him. Uh, and his ideas that were presented 200 years ago in a monograph in 1822 uh, to whether uh, vertebrates and arthropods uh, have an inversion of their dorsal ventral axis to make them comparable. So if you want to know about that, uh, tune in next week. Um, I hope you found this interesting. If so, uh, like it underneath the video, sign up for alerts. If you like, I actually don't sign up for alerts myself. I usually check out my favorite sites just uh, when I feel like it. Uh, but do subscribe and I wish you a good weekend and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.